Welcome to Fort Worth 148's podcast, where we meet to discuss Masonic topics and strive to build value in the Brotherhood. The opinions and statements of the participants do not represent any positions or stance of any Grand Lodge or Lodge, and are solely the viewpoints of the participants. Welcome back to the podcast, brethren. This is Rhett Moore, past master and current secretary for 148. Grant Gates, current junior warden with 148. Billy Hamilton, current senior steward with 148. And this is Gabriel Yagish, Master Mason with Fort Worth 148, and we have a special guest tonight. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Jamie George, and I'm the Worshipful Master of Frontier Lodge Number 48 in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Nice to have you on the show, Jamie. Sweet. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us. So, uh, Jamie, you are, uh, like you said, you're the Worshipful Master out at your lodge, and tonight we're talking about uh, Demolay International. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about your background before we get into the discussion questions? Can you tell us a little bit about your background uh, with Demolay? Uh, sure. Uh, so I joined Demolay in January 2001 when I was 12 years old. Um, I, when I first joined Demolay, uh, I joined because my friends, almost all of them, were in it. And, um, you know, I had hanging out with several of the guys. Uh, prior to and they got me involved and uh, I didn't start real active with Dean Lane until I was about 16 years old uh, but then uh, once that happened you know a spark happened and I really started understanding the the, the ideas and ideals of Dean Lay and um, you know past that point I became master counselor of my chapter Dell City chapter in uh, Dell City Oklahoma and then I uh, eventually rose up the ranks to become district master counselor state master counselor and eventually culminating with my election to be International Congress Secretary, uh, or number two in the, the world, basically, in d International oh, in wow. 2000, 2010. So I have a large and extensive uh, background in d uh, I've been chapter advisor for Stillwater Chapter uh, for the last six years. Um, we've done a great job in Stillwater. Uh, we started out with only one boy whenever I took over for another uh, excellent Master Mason, uh, Robert Cook, and then... We are now at 25 active boys, and we've won chapter of the year five times in a row in Oklahoma, which is no small feat. Uh, Oklahoma is a very strong jurisdiction for Demolay, and you know, for us to be in the position right now has been very, very. It's been a great position to be in. Nice, awesome. All right, thank you for giving us your background. Um, Absolutely. We're gonna we're gonna jump into discussion questions here. Uh, sure. And uh, Rit, you said right off the bat, you said you had a discussion question. Yes, most definitely. I had one that I've been kind of tumbling over. Uh, and what would you do with a candidate that just is not able to memorize the questions and answers? How bad are we talking here? Like, can't memorize the verbiage or can't memorize the concept at all? It, Understands the concept, but can't get the words to flow like we want them to flow. I would just we, ask him to give him the answer in plain English. And that's what we do in uh, Frontier is, you know, we actually have some uh, some gentlemen that have come through that uh, did not have, um, I, I don't want to say the cognitive ability, but they just were not able to put into the accurate words what we were trying to have them do so what we did was uh, we um, we waited the six month requirement period in Oklahoma and then at the end of that we decided to you know move them on based upon the answers in plain English English like you said um, uh, of the answers and obligations that the best they could mm -hmm. so no that's it's interesting go ahead so, Grant. so looking for the understanding um, rather than an actual memorization um, about the understanding when it comes to the, to maybe the obligation. Is, is that something where you'd want to get the obligation down? Oh, you mean like they would have to fully memorize it word for word? Get, get the obligation down word for word versus the rest of the, the, the questions and answers and explanation. Hmm. Hmm. I was going to say, I mean, if they could, but I'm just thinking overall, whether they get nervous or whatever it may be, just really have trouble. But 
you know, in the end, you see qualities in this guy that it's like, man, he's going to make a fantastic Mason. Now, but he can't quite memorize it word for word. As far you know, as and say obli- he couldn't get the obligation down. As far right. as the obligation it, it, goes, though, this is a little bit of a legalistic answer, right? But when you say the obligation, and you know you affirm it, you know whether you swear it on the Holy Bible or you affirm it by your the conduct of your character, or however you want to do this the obligation is a contract of sorts contracts are in many senses binding um and the exact verbiage of a contract is important right there are clauses and i i'm thinking of the master mason's obligation especially there are clauses of the obligations plural that are very important to understand correctly and exact phrasing can play a huge part in that. So I don't know that it's necessary for a candidate to learn the obligations word for word for word. But if they cannot uh, give the obligation word for word for word, I'm fine with them giving a plain English, this is my understanding kind of answer for each of the questions. But when it comes to the obligation, if they cannot give it word by word, they need to be able to dissect it um, and explain exactly what each clause means, because it's kind of important. You know, if we have an agreement and you don't know the terms of the agreement, then we're in trouble. No, I'm with you. Yeah, see, I I guess and maybe this is really like for the most part a Texas thing, too, because there are some states to where there is no obligation. Obligation. There's no memory work. I mean, the obligation. I have to repeat it back. You know, word perfect. Um, you know, that doesn't necessarily make them less of a mason if they're not able to do that. Oh, be careful. Don't. Yeah, we. No, I don't we, even want to get into that argument. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. We we all know. But, can everyone agree? We all know better. Yeah. Yes. Raise yes. Right, <laughs> the memory work does not make the mason. No. no. It Anyways, just a, didn't mean to is, attack you, Billy. Right? No, no. I mean, but you know, there are some brothers out there that they are still, in every sense of the word, a mason. They just may have faulty memory, you know. And our technology doesn't make it any better, right? I mean, we write down, we have our phones and our iPads, you know, met by his memory. It, it, his livelihood, a lot of time, depended on the quality of his memory. But uh, you know, we we have all these cheater devices that we don't have. to to worry about that anymore mm-hmm. um that's a fine but, point yeah no, yeah I, but i mean some guy who has a bad memory he may still display all the good qualities of the mason and you know in a case like that do you really want to hold the brother out you know because he's not able to get word mm-hmm. perfect and that's how i look at it yeah and, and i mean my my general answer is no you don't, you don't want to put that back and, and the reason i brought up the obligation one game made a great point because there are some clauses if you don't know them fully, you know you can put them in a position to be taken advantage of at some point. Um, it, it, the other thing is the obligation, um, at least in our jurisdiction, it, it just it seems to be the thing that people care that you know the most, right? Um, yeah, I've seen a lot of guys get. Almost all the questions. Well, this is what makes us a Mason. Yeah, oh, the obligation. All right. So, yeah. I, I, I could definitely get along with, hey, plain answers, but I would I would work with him real hard and see if I could at least get the obligation down. I uh, do think one part. Oh, go ahead, Jamie. Sorry. Uh, it's fine. I, I was saying if there's one part of the cat lectures that you wanted to get down and down and right is the obligations. Uh, and you guys are exactly right there. Yeah. No, I I like how you just des- how you've all described it because, I mean, you guys are talking about exasperating every effort that you can put forth to get this guy to learn it. But if it comes down to a point to where you're either going to lo- I say learn it, memorize it. <clears throat> if it comes down to a point to where we're going to lose this guy over memorizing these words, yeah, you need to look in your law book and see what the law book says about that because yeah. Now, in my Texas, understanding, it gives you the authority. 
Yeah. In <laughs> Texas, we have to ask every question. However, it is up to the lodge to determine proficiency. So the way that I interpret yep. that, and, you know, this is, I am not a lawyer, da 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 all the standard disclaimers apply. But the way that I interpret that law is we have to ask you every question, but if you want to give us the answer in plain English or even an answer that's not very good, and we know that that is the best that you are capable of at any point in time, then so be it. Um, but the way that I look at it, though, is I'm fine if they can't memorize the verbiage, but if they cannot explain the concepts to you, you know, if they can't explain why something does, you know, I'm fine if it takes you five minutes for one question and you do it totally in your own language. Uh, as long as you can convey the concept and convey that you understand the concept. If you cannot understand the concept, then this is a totally different problem. And that has, you know, that's more something to do with whether or not this person should advance at all. It's all based upon the way that your lodge defines the term proficiency. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. yep. No, and and I don't want I don't want anybody to think that's a hall pass. You know, there's something to be abused. <clears throat> it's it's a it's there to use as a tool because I think memorizing it is important. There are very few men that can't. There might be some kind of affliction that's going on there where he's not exactly capable to spit it back word for word in that amount of time. Um, but yeah, I mean, in Grand Launch Law, it says you have to learn it. It doesn't say you have to memorize it. There's Those are two different words, and every word has a specific meaning. And it, when you're talking about law, you, there's no interpreting that. Learn means one thing, memorize means another. Yep, and that's why legalism is both dangerous and important when it comes to masonry. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, <clears throat> do your best, prepare them for a successful Masonic career and teach them that memory work, the, you know, the best that you can, and they're probably going to get it, but if they can't, don't lose a good Mason over it, you know, follow the letter of the law. That's, that's the, that's the end all be all. <laughs> Did you have another one, Gabe? Before we start whipping that horse, I did have a short one. Uh, now there is uh, some an event that is going on. It is underway. It is the Fort Worth Scottish Rite Valley reunions, and Rit and I are participating in the degrees for the first time. And uh, so, as first time participants, uh, you know, I want to give us a short, short piece of time to discuss how we feel. And um, what we're looking forward to, and then Billy, as somebody who is a repeat participant, uh, how he feels about the current reunion. <laughs> so, Rick, you go first. Man, I totally dug. I was so nervous. <clears throat> you know, it was because I've kind of gotten in a groove on the first three degrees. I've I've done a few of them, so I kind of know my. I mean, He's done a few of them. He said humbly. <laughs> but I've gotten down the theatrics of it. And so it was really neat to be up on the stage and be nervous again about what I was going to say next. And I totally caught myself being a robot standing still staring in one spot, you know, no theatrics. So I was really excited, you know, to be at, in that position again, to start improving, adding to these and seeing a little growth. Cause I, I felt like I got a little stagnated with the degrees and, the first three. Not that I'm perfect, but I'm you, close. You, 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 make, <laughs> you, you make a mean King Solomon there. Uh, I'll tell you that. Uh, I should, sir. <laughs> uh, that's no doubt my favorite. You know, the, uh, I'm, yeah, having we, we fun with it. I'm having fun with it. Uh, uh, officially, Rit and I were only scheduled to be in the 13th degree. Uh, and I showed up at eight. I showed up at seven fifteen, seven thirty a.m. because I, I thought, well, you know, I don't have to be there until after lunch. But you know what? I'll be there just in case people need help. Oh boy, <laughs> I was in the fifth. I was I was in the fourth, fifth, seventh, and eleventh degrees. Uh, and then finally the thirteenth. And then Rit, you were in the sixteenth uh, degree, right? Yeah, I was in yeah. three total. 
So because I did a backstage th- reading. This was a blast. It was really goofy. I was not expecting to take the workload that I did, and I ended up doing it. A lot of it was flying by the seat of my pants. Um, <laughs> for anyone that doesn't know, uh, some of the Scottish Rite degrees use a teleprompter. Uh, so if you do have a guy who gets thrown in last minute, like me, uh, they can rely on the teleprompter. <laughs> so that it's really It's tricky, helped. though. Those words are big, man. Well, because you have to <laughs> you have to learn to balance uh, your theatrics with like pausing and reading the teleprompter. So you have to find all right. Like I'm I'm gonna have to eventually stop and read the teleprompter at some point, but I have to figure out how to make it sound like a normal person talking, and where Dude, the normal flow in conversation stops and starts. But we need right? to make that position a part of our degree teams because what if our teleprompter practiced that with us and knew our cadence yeah so you pause just like the president you know when you pause that teleprompter (laughs) stop so you don't lose your spot that that could be a good argument to be made but um talk about that yeah and and i i will say this and i do not say this to disparage the scottish right i really don't click with the content of the degrees um, that's the Scottish Rite is a lot more cerebral and intellectual, and I'm I'm a lot more about degrees that are emotional, um, and so that's kind of what's what I what I've sought in other degree systems is the emotional impact. Um, but I gotta say, um, and I'm not a fan of the class format. Really don't care for that. But you know what I do like is getting up on stage and hamming it up. So. <laughs> I was yeah, ham was extraordinary. I was ham extraordinary on Saturday. So <laughs> Billy, how about you? How how is this reunion going for you? Yeah, due to some obligations, I'm I'm only able to participate in one of the degrees on the third day. Usually, I'm behind the scenes or on a couple of different degree teams. Uh, this time, though, being able to sit out and watch, it's interesting to, uh, you know, to to see how different people are acting on stage and to, you know, pick up pointers. Hey, you know, when, when it comes to time to do my part, I, I want to do it kind of like they did, you know, um, you know, and also looking at how, when, when people, how they emote the responses that they get from the, the class that's sitting out there. Uh, so it, it's really cool to be able to kind of sit and just watch and observe. Um, I, I have to say though, uh, as it is, unfortunately, like you were talking about, it'd be great to practice with uh, with the the guy who does the prompter. I I think the problem is is that a lot of times it's hard to get together with crew. It, it's hard enough to get all the guys together for a degree team, much less to get the supporting guys who are going to be helping you with it. No. Yep. No, I agree. It would take some doing um, because I thought maybe we could get it on a computer to where they could scroll along or something. It it would take a lot of planning and doing, but it's a thought to put on the back burner. Yeah, it's one of those things that it's like, that'd be awesome if we can do it. The question is, can we do it? Yeah, because when we start doing these degrees together, you know, I'm hoping we have 98% of our lines memorized and just need it there as a crutch. Right. You know, yeah. or even if you're if you're familiar with the work, then you kind of know already kind of crescendo at this point and, and build up to. Exactly. Like I like I said in la- the last episode, all you got to do is be familiar enough with the content to uh, <clears throat> improvise when necessary. Would, would that be the you fake it till you, you make it? <laughs> yep. But um I figure uh, I've enjoyed this Scottish Rite reunion, flying by the seat of our pants. Let's talk about our main episode content tonight. So, as all we already mentioned, uh, tonight we have Jamie Jordan on the show, and we're talking about Demolay International. And I had a, we had a couple questions for Jamie. Uh, some of these have already been answered, so we'll skip those. Um, but some personal questions for Jamie. Uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself outside of the Masonic lens? So, just kind of what I do outside of the Masonic uh, world. Um, yeah, what so, are you like as a normal human being? <laughs> people, what's that about? I don't, I don't even know what being a normal human being is about. But, you know, you know I, I, I work as a software engineer um, for a small company in, in Stillwater. 
Um, and then, you know, most of my time is devoted to Deem Lane, Masonry, and Eastern Star, and York Rite, and stuff like that. Um, but I, I do have a, a girlfriend and a three year old, basically my stepson, that I, that I am not, you know, busy doing other things. But, um, you know, I have a, I have a simple life outside of, uh, masonry, but that does take up a nice chunk of my time. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned that you, you joined, you joined, uh, initially the, the Dell City ch- chapter, right? Correct. Um, and then you moved on to Stillwater eventually. Uh, what drew you specifically to Dell City and then what drew you specifically to the Stillwater chapter? Okay. So, um, I mean, long story short, it was a matter of convenience because, uh, all my friends, friends had joined Dell City chapter um and honestly we were the only chapter around uh, my town uh mm-hmm. when when we were growing up so there wasn't a whole lot of options for me to go there's a lot of masonic lodges but there wasn't a whole lot of demolay chapters uh around uh where we where we lived so it was more or less you know I either joined Dell City or I joined a chapter an hour away um and then as for Stillwater uh, I had actually moved up to Stillwater to go to Oklahoma State University. Um, and so when I moved there, the chapter there was in the middle of transitioning and they needed somebody to take over. And I just happened to be there and I was like, you know, hey, uh, I'll take it over maybe for a year or so until somebody else finds a place. And lo and behold, six years later, here I am. Ha! So you you took the bait. <laughs> this is what you're yeah, telling. Yeah, that's a sonic story. I just can't say no. Oh man, that's that's the secret Master Mason's word is no. Um yeah, right. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about the Stillwater chapter? Sure. Uh so Stillwater's a very unique chapter in my opinion. Billy might have a little bit of a opinion on that, but um, you know, we uh we are a very unique chapter in that we don't focus on the things that, you know, normal DMLA chapters, at least in Oklahoma, or even Masonic Lodges focus on, and that's membership and ritual. We actually focus on all the things outside of that, the public relations, the community service, the the projects the boys want to do. And by doing those things, we actually allow the ritual and the membership to flow naturally. Like, like we have not had a membership push, like an actual directive in year first took over. And mm-hmm. by doing the things like, you know, letting the boys plan events and letting the boys uh, enact projects, it, it it attracts their friends and it attracts, you know, the general public by our public relations. And so the other things just started growing naturally. That is super refreshing to hear. Like, <laughs> I don't know, in this day and age, it's just very awesome to hear that, that same call, uh, that same call to action that does not focus on membership. So this is, th- that is a very welcome message on this podcast. No, <laughs> and I'm, I'd love to hear them finding their niche, you know? Hell yeah. Whatever it is, community involvement, I don't care. Just pick something because when you get to work, it starts snowballing like that. And see, we actually ran a uh, battle of the bands for several years in, in Stillwater. What? And it wasn't like the big success <laughs> that we tried to do, but they wanted to do, but we did it as more of a community involvement. And we had hundreds of people come by and you know get to hear what the, the names Freemasonry and Demolay and things like that. And just the and like it's to a point now, and it's in the city of Stillwater at the very least. When somebody hears Demolay, they're like, "Oh, I've heard of that. I I I recognize the symbol because our our logo is everywhere around the town." Cool. That is awesome. Yeah, that that is, uh, and so my son and I went this summer. We went up to visit the the Stillwater chapter, and we were both just blown away by what you guys are doing. Right. And, and like when we showed up that night, it, instead of just like focusing on ritual or whatever, they were actually having like a debate contest, which was awesome. They would just oh, give them a, each the, the kids were paired off. Right. And they would give them a topic and say, you have like 90 seconds to speak about this topic. Go. That's amazing. Yeah, it's the, actually, it's called the crown tournament and we do it once a month, um, usually on the third week of the, the month. And uh, I usually, it could be, you know, a 30 second topic over something silly, or it could be a 90 second topic over something more serious. And, you know, uh, I pair two of the boys, it could just be a random number thing, or I can pair them up based on how long they've been in the chapter. And it's totally by the whim of my imagination. I could ask, 
what's your favorite color? I could ask you about the socioeconomic status in Scandinavia. You know, it's, it, but the point <laughs> is, is to teach them how to think on their feet and to, to get them more accustomed to public speaking. One of the big things that Dean Lane Masonry teaches public speaking. And by using this uh, tool, it's actually gotten the boys practicing public speaking in a safe environment that allows them to think on their feet and formulate speeches kind of on the fly. I love that. I I heard uh, one one time a grandmaster visited a lodge and they he asked the worshipful master if he had anything to say. And he said, nothing, worshipful master. And he said, well, you always have to have something to say. You know, kind of a jokingly, but, you know, kind of friendly advice. And it was like, he's right. You got to be ready for that impromptu speech. Especially if you are a dignitary of some kind. Yes, true. And just like, uh, you know, this last, this last crown tournament we had, um, it was like elevator speech competition. Like who could give the best 30 second speech over what Demolay is and how Member, new members and things like that. It's part of that organic membership thing that we're trying to put together. Ooh, give us your 30 second elevator speech on what Demolay is. So, Demolay is an organization <laughs> for young men ages 12 to 21 that teaches leadership, public speaking, and civic awareness through real world activities such as fun, public speaking tournaments, and travel. And we do a lot of community service and a lot of fun, and we do it in a safe environment for the boys to enjoy. I'd like it. That's almost practice down to the freaking <laughs> millisecond. <laughs> yep, I like it. There's, awesome. yeah, I, and I tell, I tell everyone, every organization needs an elevator speech. So I've got one for Masonry. I've got one for York Rite. You know, I've got one for. I'm working on one for Scottish Rite. It's not quite there yet, but you know, it's. I, I don't know. I'm glad the that concept is is prevalent in other parts of Masonry. So cool. Um, what is your favorite aspect of Demolay and why? So my favorite aspect of Demolay would probably be at least the way I uh, view Demolay is the individualistic manner in which we teach leadership. Um, like for example, um, you know, I am a very tattooed person and I have sometimes very funny hair and I'm a very, uh, expressive individual. And so, and that's one of the things that I teach, and one of the things that Dean Lloyd taught me was how it was to be a leader, but not like a cookie cutter sort type of leader. You gotta be, you gotta be able to know yourself before you can lead others. And if you don't have the individualistic uh, portion of uh, leadership, then honestly, I'm all all day and all night, and it really wouldn't matter. If you don't understand yourself and your ability to lead, then you're not gonna be able to lead others in any sort of way. What did that? What was it over the Temple of Delphi? Know thyself. Know thyself. <laughs> it's so true. It is very true. Um, uh, what do you think the strength, and, and this is just you as a person, not as an official of any kind, what do you think the strengths and weaknesses of Demolay are? So the strength that Demolay has is its ability to cater to its membership. It's um, it's very unique in that the boys can put together whatever programs or events they want to put on as long as they plan it, fundraise for it, whatever. Um, and that's one of the things that I think Team Lay has its biggest niche in that. And like, that's what differentiation differentiates itself from like Boy Scouts because they have very rigid things that they do every year. Whereas Team Lay, one chapter could do like a ski resort in Colorado for a trip and another chapter could go down to Texas for a trip or, or whatever they might want to do. And so the the uh, individualism of its chapters is something that really draws me to Team Lay. One of its big weaknesses and something that, you know, unfortunately has kind of come across the Masonic landscape is focusing so much on membership. It kind of takes away from the overall goal of the organization like Dean Way International as a whole is not doing great um, with membership uh, unfortunately and um, whereas some chapters like my, or my own is you know, not focusing on things like that but Dean Way International is really focusing hard on membership and pushing chapters really hard to just recruit as many members as possible and to kind of see what sticks so that's kind of one of my biggest complaints right now in the Dean Way International you know leadership side is they're just focusing on membership so much, they're kind of taken away from the overall goal of the organization. Right. So how do you think Demolay as a fraternity can improve? How can we improve? I mean, just 
right now, the biggest way we can improve is the ability to change, the ability to recognize the landscape of the youth today. Uh, we are up against so many other uh, organizations, sports, whatever, video games, you know, for that matter. You know, it, it's it's tough because back when Demo was founded in 1919, it was Demolay or another club, and then there just wasn't a whole lot of choices for a lot of towns to choose from. And so one of the things that Demolay has to do, and something we've done a very poor job of, and Masonry for that matter as well, is that, is that has changed with the times. Uh, we're, we're so far entrenched in our own tradition and our own mindset that we don't allow ourselves to be amicable to the situations that teenagers are in today. Um, the, the teenage situation is so much different now than it was back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, whatever. Uh, and that's one thing that we're just not grasping a hold of. So if I could change one thing, it would just be more, you know, transparent, more um, change its its structure to be more uh, with today's youth than, than it is currently. Because uh, right now, I mean, the International Supreme Council, I mean, let's be honest with ourselves, is just a bunch of you know, old guys in around a room telling the, the youth what they think they should be doing. And that's honestly, you know, not very conducive to what this change that needs to happen is. Yep. That's not how it was in my day. And then in the next, <laughs> and, and then in the next paragraph, how do we reach these kids? Right. <laughs> how do we reach little Jimmy when uh, back in my day we played stickball and now he's got to play, you know, PUBG mm. and Fortnite. And yeah. I mean, Bizarre, so <laughs> yeah but one of the interesting things too is is when we were talking we were talking about the method of communication today is different right like i mean we have some lodges that they don't even want anything to do with facebook but like you were saying that you actually get a lot of members from snapchat was what? a lot of the kids communicate like see like i actually have a snapchat for this door and we're actually just uh i just got approved to do a uh a facebook group and Facebook page for the Masonic Lodge to do. And our, we actually just garnered um, a few new members just from our Facebook page. And we get new members from Snapchat and Instagram and all sorts of social medias. I'd probably say half of our chapter was based off of internet connection. That is cool. I mean, because you could probably do like a, a campaign toward the parents for Demolay on Facebook yeah. and then Snapchat toward the kids. <laughs> That's exactly right. And, you know, for $10 like a week, you can put an ad out there that targets a specific demographic, and we target. Uh -huh. And uh, through that, we actually just got a master mason from another town uh, saying that his sons really want to join Demolay. And we they were actually at our event today. We did shaving cream wiffle ball up in Stillwater, and um, you know we had a couple of the the boys there, and they had a blast, and they said they want to join next Tuesday. That's, That's awesome. Legit. That yeah, is. See, crazy. this is how I know that I'm slowly going out of touch. Is that I went and looked at Snapchat and went. What now? Like, I know what Snapchat is and everything like that, but I just never really thought about using Snapchat to recruit. <laughs> so and see, going, and oh, like, geez. <laughs> when I first started thinking about it, I was like, how can I use Snapchat to recruit? And I was like, you know, and then I found out the group features that it has with it and how much the, because honestly, the teenagers don't know, don't even use Facebook. They use Instagram and Snapchat. That so, Instagram is yeah. the one that I've heard. You know, it's like people don't use Facebook anymore. And honestly, like, as somebody who's not a teenager, I d detest using uh, Facebook because it's garbage. <laughs> yeah, Facebook has really gone downhill uh, over the last several years, and that's why I've been trying to figure out what best social media to use. And I'm I'm 29 years old, so I'm relatively young in the Masonic world, so I still connect pretty well with the teenagers. Uh, in that, you know, I, I'm still I'm still pretty hip, I think. And... <laughs> I think the the you know as a as a twenty six year old uh, the Demolays don't look at me like I'm an old man yet so uh, yeah. I'm I'm hoping <laughs> at least I hope not yeah right is that what you thought about a twenty six year old when you were fourteen they uh, were old as Methuselah I mean I just hey, thought that they hey, were a, they you're, you're I thought they were real adults and now as a twenty six year old I can confirm that I am not a real adult and <laughs> nobody else <laughs> of the age of twenty five or under is for sure. <laughs> every, every time I see the boys, they remind me that I'm one step closer to 30 this year. You know what? Man, 30's not that bad. I, I, I hit it in 17. It's Don't worry about it. It, it just that's, rolls right by. That's something that my girlfriend ha has been saying. 
you know, just just to mess with me. Oh, you're turning twenty seven. You you you're turning twenty seven in August. You're almost thirty. And I'm just like, Sarah, do not do this. <laughs> Please don't do it. Me and Billy are over here like, y'all call me in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> One of the boys is so old. old. <laughs> Don't worry. I think I'm just going through my quarter life crisis. It's okay. <laughs> you realize you're halfway to 60? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> quarter life crisis, dude. That one got me. It's a real thing. I can, it's I, a real thing. <laughs> I can tell you more about it off the podcast, but yeah. Uh, I'm still waiting for my half life. I think, dude. I think I think you got that from a John Mayer song. Come on, now. <laughs> I've heard I've heard so, uh, Andy say it on, on the Office. Nardog. <laughs> love it. Nardog. So, uh, Jamie, what keeps you motivated to keep uh, laboring in the quarries, so to speak? So honestly, like one of my big passions is. Um, you know, the, the working for the youth of today. And uh, one of the big things that I'm noticing recently is the divisiveness that, you know, almost all of America is facing right now. And whether it be politics or whatever groups you're part of or, you know, religion or whatever, you know, there's so much divisiveness that you see in today's world that, you know, focusing on something, whether it be the youth or whatever, is is, is paramount to be able to be to find happiness in today's world. And that's one of the things that I really strive for myself is, you know, I, I'm a big advocate for the youth of today. And so I'll do everything I can to to uh, make the lives of the boys that much easier. Uh, try to be, you know, a leader, a mentor to them because of how much Demoy helped me personally. Uh, I had a very rough go at life for the first several years of my life. And Demoy got a, a big funk in my life. And so I... I feel very strongly that I owe whatever I can to the Masonic organizations. And that's what really gets me going through. And I understand my story through Demolay and my story through Masonry is very unique. And even if I can give my boys even a quarter of the respect and the love for these organizations that I have, that I've done my job. And that's what keeps me going is, you know, seeing the boys grow up. You know, I had my first wave of majorities this year where the boys are no longer active demolays. And to see what they've been able to go through and see the things that they've overcome and see the things that they're now doing with their lives, it makes it all worth it for me. Mm -hmm. So I, I did see that that some of those boys, too, they, they stayed on as advisors. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, actually, we got we, got, we now have 14 active advisors in the chapter right now. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, that is a that is a astronomical amount of advisors compared to a lot of other chapters, and the five boys that majority from the chapter last year are all advisors, and I have two boys this year about the majority that are also planning to become advisors. I've well. honestly never heard of that many advisors in a Demolay chapter, so that's it, that's awesome. Very rarely happens, and honestly, we have twenty advisors on about twelve, twelve to fourteen advisors that are that are active almost on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. So, at this point, I want to ask some more uh, questions about D Malay in general. We've kind of gone through your journey with D Malay and how you view D Malay, and now we've got some more general questions about D Malay. I feel like maybe we've done this backwards, but um, can you tell us what D Malay International is? So, D Malay International, um, you know, is the overarching organization that, that runs the individual chapters. Um, it is a 501c3, so any uh, donations that are given to them are tax deductible. Um, and, you know, um, it's, it's, it, it in and of itself has been around since 1919. Um, so, D Malay, um, on the international scale, it's, it's growing quite large. We're in 13 different countries right now. And there's almost a new country popping up every few months, and so Demol International as a whole is is growing. It's 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 expanding, and honestly, outside the United States, Demol is it's thriving. It's doing very 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 well. Um, it's the United States the things that need to to catch up. But um, I I don't know if I answered your question directly, but uh, <laughs> that works. That's, that's sort uh, of right. where geographically would you say that Demol is strongest right now? So, um, Demolay actually has two separate 
uh, or sorry, three separate Supreme Councils. Uh, there's one that, you know, you know, the Demo International. Uh, mm-hmm. And then there's the Supreme Council of Brazil. In Brazil, they have, I believe, it to be 40,000 members. Wow. Um, it, just, in, just in Brazil. And they have a national master counselor and, and all that. And they are gigantic. Gigantic. They they go so strong in in Brazil. It's their alumni. They, they retain members like it's nothing. Thing and uh, you know down there, you know it, a lot of families don't make a whole lot of money. And there's been some cases where there a family would spend you know fifty percent of their income to pay their son's dues into Demolay each year just to have that status symbol of saying that you're a Demolay. That's incredible. Yeah, it's crazy. It is the same way in the Philippines as well. That so, is bonkers. So then are the Supreme Councils in Brazil and the Philippines then separate from Demolay International? Yes, they are actually run um, by their own national organizations. I believe Australia and Canada are as well. Um, okay. But two countries that come and are under the, the Demolay International uh, banner. Okay. So then, um, can you tell us what values Demolay stands for? So the seven cardinal virtues of Demolay are filial love, reverence for sacred things, courtesy, comradeship, fidelity, cleanness, and patriotism. So those are the seven like uh, ideals that we teach in the chapters. And so, so um, and then there's the bulwarks of the Bible, flag, and school books. You know, being able to respect your country, respect and tolerate others' opinions. Um, respect and tolerate other people's uh, religious views and their backgrounds and whatnot. Those are the cardinal, I think, tenets of what DMLA tries to offer. Okay. Um, so what is a senior DMLA? So a senior DMLA is, uh, is, a, is a young man who reaches the age of 21. Um, they Once they turn 21, they are no longer active members in the organization. They become uh, on an automatic new class of member called a senior DMLA. Um, and just in Oklahoma, that we just instituted the Alumni Association, which I am the president of the Oklahoma City branch uh, for this year. I'm the first president of the Oklahoma City Alumni Association. And at this point, uh, now all of these new, uh, I, I can't remember the class number, but these new class uh, members are now available to join the Alumni Association and, you know, continue that DMLA experience, even though they're now senior DMLAs. Okay. Um, so then... Uh, that's what you call majoritying out, right? Yeah, when when we when we say uh, majoritying out or hit the majority, that's what we mean. Uh, they just hit the age of twenty one. Yeah. Uh, now there is some uh, overlap. So, like, I was actually twenty two. Um, whenever I majorityed out of DMLA because I was an international officer. So, if you're an international or a state officer, you can actually, um. Um, extend that time after your majority service. Ah, uh, okay. So basically, it's it's your twenty first birthday or whenever your term of office ends, whichever comes later, right? Correct. Okay. So, and you've already kind of mentioned this, but you, you've already mentioned that it, you know it's for for boys twelve to twenty one. But I guess character wise, who is Demolay for? Um, so Demolay is really for, for anyone. Like, for example, my, my chapter is, is, a is a ragtag group of boys that come from a very wide and varied background. Um, so Demolay doesn't have like a certain archetype of, of boys that we're looking for. It's, you know, we, our, our overall goal is to make good young men better. And whether or not that young man comes from a, a, bad background or a good background or whatever you know it it's really open for anybody and open for for anybody who wants to be a better person okay uh what is a dad okay so a dad um so uh they're starting to try to go away from the term dad they're trying to go more towards advisors because now that women are very prevalent in the uh, advisory councils of today's DMOA, um you know so w- when they mention like I'm Dad Jordan, um, 
the, the tradition came from when 1919 was around. The boys back then, they lost their fathers in the war. And Frank Sherman Land, the founder, uh, didn't want to be called dad. And that's what the boys wanted to call him. And he felt that disrespected their actual fathers. So they compromised and called him Dad Land. And that's kind of where the uh, tra- the tradition of Dad Jordan or, you know, Dad whatever or Mom whatever kind of came from. So it is, so it is a title then? It is a title, yes. Okay. Like, I'm the chapter of, of Stillwater chapter. Like, brother, just Dad. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Um... So who are the officers in the chapter? Because you've already mentioned that you'll have, you know, Mom Smith or Dad Smith or whatever, and you mentioned a Master Counselor. Um, yes. The Master Counselor is kind of like the Worshipful Master. Um, yes. Who all else do you have in a chapter? So, okay, I'm going to give you the uh, ritual part here. It's uh, one of the Senior Counselor's duties in the opening and closing of the chapter is the list of the chapter's uh, member or the officers, very much like uh, the Senior Warden does in Lodge. So it's the master counselor, senior counselor, junior counselor, senior deacon, junior deacon, stewards, order, scribe, treasurer, sentinel, chaplain, marshal, standard bearer, almoner, and preceptors. In oh. Stillwater, we actually elect our top four officers, three counselors, and the senior deacon. Okay. And then do you all have a full contingent of officers? Uh, right now, Stillwater Chapter does have a full uh, set of 20, 22 officers, yes. That's really rare. I like that. <laughs> Wow, 22. Yes. Yeah, Eastern Star also has a gazillion officers. So that's uh, that's awesome when you have an organization that has that many listed officers on the rolls and you can actually fill them because that, that feels kind of rare in the Masonic family nowadays. Um, yeah, it's, it's very unique uh, to see a chapter have that many at one go. Um, it's uh, not a lot of chapters, especially in Oklahoma, can can say that. I'd say there's probably only two right now in the state that can field a, a full set of officers. Okay. Um, so now I wanted to ask, uh, what is a squire? Okay, so the squires, um, we're actually the only chapter in the state that has a squire's manner. Okay. Um, so the squires are for boys uh, 9 to 12. Uh, so when they turn 12, they go through the graduation ceremony and become demon malays. Um, so the squires are kind of like demon malay light. Uh, so like our squire manor, they meet on every other Tuesday instead of every Tuesday. And they get taught the same things just in a more simplistic way for the boys to understand kind of what is expected of them from when they do join demon malay. And so like, for example, our, our, Demolay obligations are roughly 13 paragraphs. Their obligations are like seven lines. Okay. And so, yeah. So it's, it's, it's really quite adorable if you kind of just ask me, but, uh, it's really cool to see these young boys, you know, learning, you know, valuable skills that's going to help them later. Okay. And they're easy. They meet in manners. Okay. Correct. Yeah. They meet, they, yeah, it's the squires manners. So, like, for example, our manners, the Travis Matt Fast manner of squires. And um, named after a, a prominent Mason here in Oklahoma. Um, uh, and so uh, they, they meet in a um, small organization called Manners. And there's only one in Oklahoma, but I believe it was founded in Washington back in the 90s. And it's kind of grown since then. So and now it's an official uh, version of DMLA. They have their own class. They have their own membership stats. They have their own membership rituals and things like that. Now, there there is also like on the opposite end of the spectrum too. There there is a group for the older demolays before they hit majority, isn't it? There the the priories. The priory, yeah. The um, I can't remember the full long name of the of the knighthood, but um, oh, I just pulled I, it up. It's kind of crazy. It's yeah, it, the chivalric knights of the holy order of the fellow soldiers of Jacques de Molay. Yeah. And I actually founded the Oklahoma Association of Knighthood in uh, back in 2008. Uh, so Knighthood in Oklahoma was founded by myself. Um, and it's a smaller organization still because there's there's a very big age gap in Oklahoma. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of 19, 20 year olds. And then past that, it's a bunch of 16 and younger. So all these like older guys now get together in Knighthood and do the RD ceremonies, do the uh, initiations and installations that 
some small, some smaller chapters may not be able to do themselves. And it's a really unique organization because it gives the older guys a chance to kind of revitalize themselves in DMLA. So are the priories invitational for DMLA, or is that just something that you can join? I think that's based on jurisdiction by jurisdiction, but in Oklahoma, only nine members are able to join the priory each year, and it's by invitation. Okay. That's cool. That is really cool. Um, so what are, can you tell us a little bit about how things work at the, I guess, grand level or executive level? So like on the state level or, or international level? Um, I guess a little bit of both. I have, uh, that's, I have a separate question that, that ties in well to this one. But the, the other question is how does the regional substructure work by country, state, region, chapter, et cetera? Um, okay, so I guess. So- how things work if you're an executive officer, and then also just how the structure of the organization works. Okay, so the structure of the organization, so at the bottom you have the chapters, the individual chapters, um, and then it goes, uh, in a lot of jurisdictions, they have a district uh, level where it has like a group of different chapters, and then you go to the state or jurisdictional level, um, which uh, that'd be like a country or a state or whatever. Um, and then past that, there's the regions, which are collections of jurisdictions, like for example, Texas and Oklahoma, Louisiana, Missouri, Arkansas, and Kansas are part of region six. And there's eight regions in the United States. And then region nine, uh, is, uh, Europe and region 10 is South America. And, uh, as new jurisdictions are founded, then more regions obviously will have to be uh, generated. Uh, right there in the right now they're in the process of integrating uh, some countries and I believe would be region 11 um, moving forward but but uh, so that's that's the and then there's the Deemlayer national scope and so uh, on the membership side so the boys uh, there's the state uh, there's the chapter counselors district counselors um, state counselors and then past the state it just jumps straight to international. There used to be region coordinators, uh, so now it, they just have uh, 10 cabinet members, which are directly underneath the International Master Counselor and International Congress Secretary. And the International Congress Secretary and International Master Counselor, are, they have two very separate jobs. I, I hesitate by saying that one's higher than the other, but the IMC, his job is to be basically the liaison between Demolay and other organizations so like if there's any important speeches that need to be made it's done by him and the international congress secretary is the guy that enacts the international supreme or the international Demolay congress's um um plans to the regional and and, uh, state levels and then on the adult side there's you know individual chapters and then so on so forth and the executive officers of each state are like the uh grandmaster assigned uh heads of each state and so they have supreme rule in their jurisdictions the only person that can outdo them is the grandmaster which right now the grandmaster is Raman shell from the state of oklahoma and okay. um and so and then there's the grand master grand senior counselor grand junior counselor and then you have the international supreme council and then on the flip side there's the board of directors that kind of helps run the day-to-day operations of the organization mm-hmm so then the, am I right in assuming that the international, like an executive officer has to be an adult, but like the international master counselor is a active DMLA? Correct. Okay. Uh, as long as, as long as they are younger than the age of 21 when they are elected, then mm-hmm. yes, they are, uh, they are an active DMLA. Yeah. So how do you, you know, for active DMLAs, right? Getting from DMLA to, let's say, international master counselor, like that's got to be, you know, I mean, somebody's strapping a rocket to your butt and you know sending you into outer space what is the trajectory to uh the position that you held or the international master counselor what does that look like so the trajectory uh so basically you have to become as the state master counselor of your jurisdiction uh, there's obviously a lot of campaign that goes along with that but once you get to that level if you decide to run for international you have to start campaigning on the nationwide scale and uh, with the advent of Facebook and social media, campaigning has actually become a lot easier now that you're able to talk to people. Um, so Facebook was starting to gain popularity uh, whenever I was a state master counselor and running for international congress secretary, and I used social media to my advantage. 
And I actually traveled to the four corners of the United States and I got my nominator to be from Northern California jurisdiction and my seconder to be from New York. And so since I and since I visited all eight uh, regions and I visited the four corners of the United States, I already had sort of a wide reaching span for my campaign. And um, so that's the way you have to do it uh, whenever you run for international office. You have to be able to you have to have the funds to travel. You have to be able to you know, be able to make speeches and, and do well in other jurisdictions that you may not be uh, familiar with. And uh, just my my trajectory was kind of unique in that um, the uh, the Zimole Congress was not really refined as it is now. And one that was part of um, the year before me and my year was actually getting the the rules and regulations and the duties of the Dimley Congress and involved and invested. Wow. Okay. Cool. So that is totally hectic. Then. Yeah, it's 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 a very hectic process, and I actually only won by four votes in my year that won. Wow. Yeah. So it was pretty competitive. I was up against a gentleman from Michigan. And uh, it was it was a, it was a very intense election. I would have demanded a recount. <laughs> <laughs> so where wow. where is Dimole International located? Like, is there a headquarters that's physically located somewhere, or is it more like other bodies where they rotate? How does that work? So the Dimole International headquarters is static. It's uh, in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Okay. Now, as International Congress Secretary, did you have to spend a lot of time there? So we, we traveled all across the United States. Uh, we actually, our, our board of directors meetings that I attended um, were all across the United States. They were rotating. I had a very, uh, a very active man as my grandmaster, and that's uh, Robert Cockerham of uh, Missouri. And uh, he had his board of directors meetings all throughout the United States. So I really only traveled to the Leadership Center, I'd say maybe six times. Okay. Uh, but I could have gone a lot more uh, being from Oklahoma. It's really not that bad of a drive up there. But um, I didn't spend a whole lot of time up there. Uh, they wanted me to be at all of the other events, you know, outside of Kansas City. Okay. Okay. Um, so what does the yearly schedule for a chapter usually look like? Uh, so a lot of chapters either meet, you know, biweekly or weekly. Like uh, Stillwater Chapter meets every Tuesday. Um, and monthly, I mean, it just depends on how active their state is. Like, for example, Oklahoma has 13 or no, 15 active chapters now. And so there's usually some sort of chapter event going on throughout the month on a Saturday. Um, and, uh, for example, in, in our chapter in March, it's Demolay month. Uh, and that's the way that that's the way it is in, in many chapters it is, um, they do some special events in March to signify that. And Stillwater Chapter actually has 24 events planned in the 31 days of March. Oh, wow. Yeah. That is intense. Okay. And we initiated 11 uh, new boys in the last week. Wow. So, you, and, so Stillwater is just chugging along. Yeah. Oh, yeah. As of right now, I think the count was Stillwater Chapter alone had new members this year than 39 other states have. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. And in fact, one of our boys, Walker Euler, um, has initiated more boys this year than twenty other states have. Really? Yeah. Okay. So, is there some sort That's of good. like award or honor that you can get for initiating people, or how does that work? Yeah. So, if you initiate one, then you get a number one pin. Uh, if you initiate five, you get what's called the Founders Membership Medal. And then if you get 10, you get what's called the Blue Honor Key. And then for every 10 past that, you get a star to put on that Blue Honor Key. Okay. What do you, what do you think has been the most, uh, with, I guess, successful tactic in uh, bringing in new members? Honestly, just not focusing on it. Um, don't <laughs> Not pushing the members to focus on membership. By having a good program and having a solid programming schedule in place, the membership's going to come to you, and that's going to be for Lodge, for Dimelay, whatever. If you don't have a good structure, if you don't have a good program in place, the membership's not going to come or, or stay. And so that's the way that's the way that I built the chapter up is by not telling the boys, oh, we have to get five new members by this time. We do have quarterly goals. Um, 
you know, my girlfriend now, she helped me implement what's called the mini game project. And that's where we sit down with the boys and say, all right, guys, we have three months in this quarter. What do you want to get done during these three months? And then every two weeks we do a mini game update. And then we tell the boys, okay, you've hit 50% of these goals. Here's where we're at. But we don't spend more than 15 minutes on it. We just give the guys an update. Here's where we're at. And then if they meet certain benchmarks by the end of each month, then they get a special like surprise. Like, for example, by hitting the January goal, we're going to pie the new, the pie, the counselors. And then since they hit the February goal, they get to have like a fancy pizza party. And if they hit the March goal, I have to go to a meeting in a onesie. And it's, it's something like that. You know what I mean? Gotcha. Um, I like so it. I feel like we should make a standard policy at four, uh, at one forty eight for the worshipful master to have to go to stated in, in a onesie. <laughs> yeah, I, right. I actually wear a purple top top. That's all my luck means. <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. Purple Thanks. top hat. Just straight Mad up. Hat I love it. <laughs> Our chapter uh, color is purple, and we have a mustache that has the Stillwater kind of cut out of it. Our logo. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, so you mentioned this earlier, right? Uh, but uh, female advisors. Uh, when did uh, DMLA International start using female advisors? So DI started using female advisors, I want to say, back in the 90s. Okay. But it really didn't start prevalent until the, the 2000s. Um, and on like right now, like Stillwater, we have uh, out of our fourteen advisors, I think I was, I think it's six or seven of them are, are uh, females now, and it's it's um it's it's without the female advisors, a lot of chapters around the United States would go under. Uh, we have three chapters in Oklahoma that are run by women. That uh, the cha- the primary chapter advisor is a woman. Wow, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a question about some of the awards, and I'm looking at I'm looking at the list right now, and I wanted to ask about the degree of Chevalier, uh, which mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm saying that right, uh, the Cross of Honor, and the Legion of Honor, and then and uh, can you tell me about those, and then any other ones that are kind of notable that uh, would be worth talking about? Okay, so in most of the country, it's 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 Chevalier, but I know in uh, in Texas and Louisiana, they I think they call it the Chevalier or or whatever it might be. Ah, um, so I but, did get it right the first time. I <laughs> okay, yeah, and there's there's a lot of uh, you know ribbing back and forth from the advisors from uh, Oklahoma and and Texas and Louisiana about the way they say it. But okay, uh, one of the prominent Masons here in Oklahoma, Frank Kell, he's from Louisiana, and he he is adamant about Chevalier. Uh, but the Chevalier is kind of the highest honor you can receive as an active DMLA. And um, that, that's based upon your service as a DMLA. You don't have to be a past master counselor to receive it. Um, but there's uh, a lot of work that goes into it. Um, and Stillwater Chapter, for example, we only give out two a year. And that's if we find two guys that are deserving. And a lot of chapters have different ways on how they give out the Chevalier, but they're nominated, they're voted on by the International Supreme Council each year, and then they're given out uh, throughout the year at different jurisdictions, times. That, that, like, for example, we give ours out at Conclave. Um, and so the, the Cross of Honor is uh, was generated uh, primarily by, I believe it was founded by Frank S. Land for service to Dean Malay as an advisor. And sort of the way it's kind of permutated to now is so women can't receive the Legion of Honor because you have to be either a, a past DMLA or a Master Mason to receive the Legion of Honor. And I'll get to that in a second. So what the, the Cross of Honor now is primarily geared as a way to honor the, the women uh, as advisors. I wow. actually have my Cross of Honor. I received that back in 2014. Um, and that was sort of, that was a Frank S. Land personal award that was generated by him. And then the Legion of Honor is a, uh, is kind of like the ultimate, uh, honor that you can receive in DMLA. And that's going above and beyond as an advisor giving back to DMLA. And I received my, uh, Legion of Honor back in 2016, uh, as an active Legion of Honor. And active Legion of Honors are those that were previously Demolays um, when they were younger. 
and you have to be 25 or yeah, you have to be 25 years old to receive it, um, or 35 if you're an honorary Legion of Honor. An honorary Legion of Honor can go to any, um, I believe it's just Master Masons that have gone above and beyond for for Demolay. There's also what's called the Past Master Counselor Meritorious Service Award, which is another big award uh, that's starting to get a lot of resurgence. And that is where a Master Counselor of a chapter, if he does what needs to be done, you know, six new members meet all the obligatory days, um, you know, open and closing a meeting without the need of a ritual in hand, stuff like that. And if they accomplish those things, they get what's called the Past Master Counselor Meritorious Service Award. And um, it used to be a very prestigious award, but it's starting to make a bit, a bit of a resurgence. Like, for example, Excalibur chapter in Yukon, uh, they've had 17 in a row, and Stillwater's chapter has had 11 in a row. And so that's starting to make a, a pretty big comeback, too. Okay, okay. Um, why would you say that it is important for uh, young men to be involved in DMLA? It provides direction. Um, it provides structure. Um, it provides a way to um, become more familiar uh, and push yourself into a place that you may not have seen yourself before. Uh, so pushing the teenagers into a, out of their comfort zone is a very important task of mine as chapter advisor because the way that the teenagers are growing up these days, it's very easy for them to fall into a routine that they like and they don't, they're not really pushed. And that's one thing that I think Teamway offers is an ability to push them outside of their comfort zone to learn to be better, you know, people, to be better businessmen, to be better, you know, leaders. And, you know, that's kind of what I can see a young man getting out of Teamway is an ability for structure, an ability for leadership, an ability for them to grow as people. Okay. Um, now, I wanted to ask... Uh, who can get involved in DMLA beyond the boys, right? Who can get involved and how can we get involved with DMLA? For me personally, um, I've been pushing my lodge, you know, just by saying if I can get one new Mason to attend one DMLA event every month, then that will be enough for me to say that our lodge is helping out. And that's one thing that I really would love to see more of is the Masonic lodges being a part of their DMLA chapters. Because right now, like for example, I have so many advisors in my chapter, but only three of us are master masons. And, um, you know, that's where a lot of the advisorship was supposed to be from is from their respective lodges. But really, anybody can be a part of Demolay, you know, as an advisor. Uh, and if you're over the age of 21, male or female, you can be a part of, an, of any chapter. Um, you just have to ask uh, one of the advisors or the chairman of the chapter. And they will get you involved with the um, the Dean Blair National Youth Protection Program or the DAD program. Um, and then once you get done with that online training, you take a test and then you pay the $48 background check and you're an advisor. So it's a really easy process and they're making it a lot easier with everything being online now. Um, so anybody can be involved. There's a background check. So obviously if you went around killing 15 people, then you can't be a, a, an advisor in Dean Blair, But Hopefully you know, not. Yeah, hopefully not. Um, uh, you know, and so um, I encourage anybody, if they can, a parent or just a brother or sister, like one of my my assistant chapter advisor is uh, a, a young lady whose brother was in Dean Blay. So, you know, anybody can be a part. You know, that's absolutely generally not an issue. Now, where would you say that Dean Malay is headed in the next 10 years? The next 10 years is going to be a big pivotal point for Demolay. Um, right now, each year, Demolay loses about anywhere between 500 to 2,000 members from its rolls. And being only having 15,000 on its rolls right now, either we're going to rebound or we may not see Demolay around in 10 years, unfortunately. It may be more of an international organization than a United States organization. And unless many Grand Lodges recognize the importance of what Demolay has to offer, um, you're probably not going to see Demolay thriving as much as it should or it could in the United States because um, it's it's a twofold problem that I'm seeing, at least in Oklahoma and from other jurisdictions that I've talked to, is that uh, the Grand Lodge doesn't push its lodges to support Demolay. 
But now the lodges that do support Dean Moy are very passionate about it and generally do a very good job supporting them. But it's getting the other lodges across the state to to invest and become a part of Dean Moy and start a Dean Moy chapter. No Dean Moy chapter that I've ever heard of has ever failed due to lack of membership. It's always been the lack of advisors. So we have to be able to find a better pool of advisors to be able to maintain Dimoy. And that's where the Masonic Lodges and the Grand Lodge can really come into play. And without that support, without that, you know, that that adult leadership, you're probably not going to see Dimoy thrive very well in the next coming years. I would love to see that change. But if you look at places like Brazil and the Philippines, they they all but force each of their districts within their jurisdictions to have a Dimoy chapter. And that's kind of where we need to go as Grand Lodges and, and Grand Jurisdictions of Masonry if we want to make Dimoy a viable option uh, 10, 15, 20 years down the future. Wow, okay. I like that take on it. It's a lot more active and involved. I mean, I would love to sit there and say, yeah, we'll initiate you know 3,000 kids a year. But let's be frank, uh, I, with only 700 chapters across the United States, do we want 700 places to have 20 members or would we have 1,400 places to have 20 members? Without that expansion, Demolay is not going to grow. I mean, we can initiate all we want to, but I, I want to see other chapters that are closer around. Like right now, Stillwater Chapter is the only chapter in the whole mid-central uh, part of Oklahoma, or the, I'm sorry, the north-central part of Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. And I'd love to see neighbor. And I'd love to see other chapters pop up. And without that, Demolay is not going to expand. So earlier, uh, you had mentioned that uh, you currently have three Master Masons in your advisory board. And from what I understand, uh, you have to have a minimum of three Master Masons in order to have the Himalay chapter in your lodge. Yeah. Um, is there any other requirements that are needed for a lodge that is interested in having their own Himalay chapter? So the only requirements are, uh, uh, as, as you said, the three Master Masons, uh, they have to be on the board. The chapter advisor can be anybody. It doesn't have to be a Master Mason, but the chairman of the chapter does have to be a Master Mason. Um, and then you just need to fund the, the chapter. You need some, some financial support. You need some um, just, you know, ability to to meet there. And, um, yeah, that's really about it. There's not a whole lot of an actual, you know, requirement from a lodge to maintain a Dimoy chapter. You just need three guys that are willing to take some time mm-hmm. and uh, do what needs to be done to lead the chapter. Is there a minimum number of uh, boys that are needed to be active in the chapter? Uh, to get your charter, you have to have, I believe it's 15 boys. Um, uh, but to get your letters temporary, I think you only need to have five. Uh, I may be wrong on that, but you start with your letters temporary then I believe when you hit 15 or 20, I can't remember the specifics, that's when you get your charter. Okay. Well, Jamie, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Uh, this has been a really cool discussion, uh, especially, you know, for me, I've always been kind of curious about DMLA, but I haven't really known a lot about it. Um, so I wanted to bring up our fraternal quote of the week. And this is actually by a uh, brother and a Dean Um This is this is an excerpt from a passage from John Steinbeck's novel, uh, East of Eden. And the characters Adam and Samuel are listening to uh, Adam's Chinese cook, uh, Lee. And he's discussing the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis in a longer discussion specifically about the Hebrew word uh, Timshel. Adam said, do you mean these Chinese men believe the Old Testament? Lee said, These old men believe a true story, and they know a true story when they hear it. They are critics of truth. They know that these sixteen verses are a history of humankind in any age or culture or race. They do not believe that a man writes fifteen and three quarters verses of truth and tells a lie with one verb. Confucius tells men how they should live to have good and successful lives. But this, this is a ladder to climb to the stars. Lee's eyes shone. You can never lose that. It cuts the feet from we- under weakness and cowardliness and laziness. Adam said, I don't see how you could cook and raise the boys and take care of me and still do all this. Neither do I, said Lee. But I take my two pipes in the afternoon, no more, no less, like the elders. 
and I feel that I am a man. And I feel that a man is a very important thing. Maybe more important than a star. This is not theology. I have no bent towards gods, but I have a new love for that glittering instrument, the human soul. It is a lovely and unique thing in the universe. It is always attacked and never destroyed, because thou mayest. And that was written by Dad John Steinbeck, charter member of Watsonville Chapter in Watsonville, California, former member of Salinas Lodge 204 in California, and the uh, 1995 Demolay Hall of Fame inductee in his book East of Eden. So, gentlemen, nice. yeah, I saw that Stein, Steinbeck was a, a Demolay, and I thought, man, I have to, I have to throw him in there. So, gentlemen, uh, closing thoughts. Uh, we'll go. Uh, Rit, Grant, Billy, myself will speak for a maximum of two minutes and then Jamie can have the floor. Rit, thoughts? Uh, you know, for me, you know, we've always had kind of a indirect supporting of the Demolay, our chapter there that meets in the temple, but I think uh, after hearing this podcast and hearing Jamie talk, maybe we need to get a little more hands-on. Yeah. There's a there's a lot of good stuff that goes on in that D Malay, and I think it could really add, you know, add a piece to the society. Growing up, good men, so I thoroughly enjoyed it. Grant, how uh, about you, Jamie? I, you know, I was unusually quiet for for, for this podcast. Um, I was just kind of sitting back and learning. Um, it, I've never known all too much about Demolay, but I feel that I know much, much more now. And uh, I'll have to re-listen to this soon. <laughs> Billy, how about you? Uh, Jamie, I, again, I, I want to thank you for coming on here. And uh, thank you for welcoming me and my son when we went to your chapter this summer. Um, I, I, am, I have to admit, I, I had some, you know, there have been some, some questions that that we've had, but uh, seeing your enthusiasm made me even more enthusiastic about it. So, you know, thank you for the work you're doing. And uh, I, I think it's something that has a lot of value. And, and as Rich said, something that we need in today's society. And, and I wanted to say, uh, you know, thanks for coming on and talking about Demolay. Uh, I've, you know, I've been to a couple of you know, what they told me that, hey, you're a master mason. Now you can show up to Demolay meetings, you know. Uh, and I thought that was kind of cool. And I showed up and I really enjoyed uh, uh, the local chapter here is H.M. Mark's chapter in Fort Worth. And I really enjoyed it because it was kind of like a lodge meeting, but it's a bunch of goofy teenagers having goofy teenager fun. And that was that was an amazing thing to see. Uh, it was a lot less dry than your average lodge meeting, which was kind of wonderful. And, uh, you know, I, I've been wondering more about how it works and what these kids get out of it. Because, you know, I talk with the Demolays at the temple all the time, and they're always having a blast. So, you know, I, I, I just a wonderful opportunity to get to learn more about it formally um, from somebody who's been there and done that, you know, so to speak. So, but, uh, Jamie, if you have any closing thoughts you'd like to leave uh, with us, uh, please go ahead. So, as Worshipful Master, um, one of my big goals was to get more of the, the Masons involved with the chapter. And I think that's a very key point to the survival of the current chapters that are in existence. And that's having a good relationship for with, with, I'm sorry, with its, um, with its lodge. And that is one thing that lodges that have Demolay need to understand as well is that, a lot, of, a lot of lodges that have Demolay are now asking the question, and it's an unfortunate question, but how is it going to help my lodge? Well, it's not if you're not active. Uh, if your lodge is not actively sending its members to a Demolay meeting, and you're not interfacing with the boys, then the boys are going to have no reason to ever join your lodge. And by me now being Worshipful Master, and uh, they see me active with Masonry, they see me active with the Demolay chapter, and they're starting to see some other Master Masons just coming by, just saying hi, you know, coming to a meeting, being interested in what they're doing. It's starting to make them ask questions like, hey, how can I join Masonry? Hey, how can I join, you know, be a part of the Masons? You know, I got asked questions today by some of the younger boys, like, hey, what do the Masons do? And 
that has just been a big resurgence for us. Like I had now six Demolays now become Masons in the last year. And some of their A teams, some of their 21. Uh, but there's been now, I, I'd say we have 21 active Lodge members, and now six of them are Demolays. And nine of them are part of Stillwater Chapter with the three Master Masons that are advisors. So Stillwater Lodge or Frontier Lodge is really started to become more Demolay friendly because the lodge itself became more Demolay friendly on its own. So I encourage every lodge, if you're a member of a lodge out there that has a Demolay chapter, to push the lodge to be a part of the chapter. Because if you really want to help your lodge and you really want to have a good solid base of good young men that are going to become men in your community, get with Demolay. It's really going to help your lodge out. That's awesome. Thank you. Sweet. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, that's very poignant. So, um, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you can find more info on us at www.fortworth148.org. We are at Fort Worth Lodge 148 on Facebook. We are, our email is info148 at fortworth148.org. If you live in the 64th district of the Grand Lodge of Texas and you want to promote an event, Please reach out to them at 64th.org. That's 64th.org. We have an event coming up in September. It's a big old uh, conference, and we're going to have a bunch of speakers. We're calling it Texas Masonicon. At, uh, and you can find more info on Texas Masonicon at www.texasmasonicon.com. Uh, that's uh, Texas Mason, I you know, on, O-N. So Texas Mason, uh, or Texas Masonic. There you go. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> it's a long day. Uh, and uh, we are at Texas Masonic Con on Facebook and Twitter. You can pre-order tickets uh, for $45 uh, for this event, and it's on September 15th. So you can pre-order for $45 until August 15th, and then it's $55 or at the door. Jamie, would you like to leave the listeners with any contact info for your lodge or Demolay chapter or anything? Uh, sure. So we do have a, um, uh, our website. We just got a new one. So I hope if I get it right, masons.org, I believe. Uh, we just got a new website. Uh, um, recently, we're trying to do a big internet push. Uh, but you can contact me directly uh, for Stillwater chapter or for Stillwater or for Frontier Masonic Lodge questions at stillwater at okdemolay.com. Uh, that goes directly to me, um, and I can answer any questions uh, from the Lodge as well. Okay. Awesome. Hey, thanks again, Jamie. Anytime. For sure. Enjoyed it, gentlemen. This is Rip Moore signing off. Grant Gates signing off. This is Billy Hamilton signing off. This is Gabriel Yagish signing off. This is Jamie Jordan signing off. 